In continuing with our discussion of the software development life cycle, we move on into the second phase or the application design phase. Now here again as a reminder is the SDLC process flow and what we have coming into the second phase is going to be that document, that established scope, the goals and milestones for what it is that we want our application to achieve. Now it's our responsibility to begin designing around this. What's the best way to do this? We could just jump right into it and begin doing it, but usually we find that that does not produce nearly as great an outcome as if we approach it with a strategy, some kind of a plan in mind. If you're not already aware of it, I would like to introduce you to, in the world of human psychology, a concept called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. All this is simply saying is that in the life of a human being, some things are much more important than others. A good job, respect among colleagues, friendship, possessions. These are not nearly as important as things as water or food, shelter. Uh, having all the money in the world is irrelevant if you're unable to provide any kind of sustenance or protection from the elements. That's what Maslow's hierarchy establishes, that the most fundamental elements must be achieved before you can begin to satisfy the higher level needs of a human being. And the reason I bring that to your attention is to help you understand that applications and mobile services, they have a hierarchy of needs too. As you can see by looking at this chart, the most fundamental thing that anyone will expect your application to be is reliable. It does not matter if it's fast, if it's pretty to look at. If I download and install your mobile application and I cannot rely on it to do what it is that I am expecting it to do, I will uninstall it. And most people will say the same thing. We want to make certain that we design according to this hierarchy. We must address reliability before we address any of the higher levels. Now, as a developer, this is our great challenge because we are at the very bottom. We need to begin building the base and the higher levels on top of it. Whereas users, from the moment that they download and install your application, they're going to be looking at it from a top-down perspective. The first thing they are going to notice about your application is if it looks nice and then if it's organized or fast. So while we are seeing things as developers from the bottom up, they see it from the top down. This is a gap that we need to figure out how we are going to bridge. We have a few strategies for you to consider to be able to do that. The first is when you are looking at the services that you are going to be providing with your mobile application, start with a flow chart. You've probably seen these before elsewhere in decision trees or on other projects. Here is an example of a flow chart with regard to logging in to a service. Now from a user perspective, that's something that's very simple. I see a box for a username. I see a box for a password. I type them in. I click sign in. And that should be the end of it. But from a developer perspective, there's so much more that we need to do. We need to check to see if the credentials actually match. What happens if they don't? What information are we going to give them? What if they forgot their password? Is there a way that we can help them recover that without allowing them access into someone else's account? There is so much that happens behind the scenes that we as developers must be aware of that should be transparent and invisible to the users. Once again, this is that gap that we must bridge. So starting with this flow chart of understanding how each different step in your process will be executed and where to go depending on the outcome, is going to help you understand how you are going to start structuring your actual application. Once you have the structure and the flow of your process defined, move on to something called wireframe mockups. These are much in application design, the same thing that you find in the movie industry when prior to filming a movie or television show, Everyone gets together in a room and with very rough drawings of a scene, they will put them up on a wall and people will look at them and it helps to establish, okay, 
This is where the actors will be. This is how they will stand. This is how the camera will shoot it at this angle. This helps you to define what the scene is going to look like before you actually film it. The benefit of this is if you don't like the way one scene looks, it's very easy to just draw some other quick sketches to replace them instead of having to do the filming all over again. It's faster and it saves money. And it's the same with developing your application. Doing these wireframe mockups, these are the storyboards for your application to help you design what it is going to look like. And we have a few design suggestions for you to keep in mind as you build these mockups. Understand that from a user perspective, there are certain things that we as users expect and certain things that we don't even think about, but when we need them, if we see them, we're glad they're there. We'll go through them. The first is text input. Now, if you have a look at the diagram on the left, this is very common to what you would see with forms on a non-mobile website in the very early days of the internet. This is not going to work on a mobile device, especially with a smaller screen size and limited input. By unifying them into a column where they are stacked on top of each other, the most common motion a user makes when they are holding their phone is a swipe. That swipe allows them to easily go from one text box to the next without having to click all over the screen to type in their data. Something else to keep in mind is, yes, the size of the buttons that you're going to use in your application. Not many people realize that this is actually an important issue. If your button is too small for the average finger to touch, it's going to be very difficult to interact with your application. Keep in mind this information that was produced by a study from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The average human finger is going to be somewhere in the area of about 57 pixels wide. Keep that in mind when you are designing your application. Also keep in mind your button layout. Now one thing to remember here is that for whatever reason, almost 90% of the world is right hand dominant. This is more often than not the hand that people will be using to hold and interact with their phone. So consider, as you can see in these two graphics, the image on the left is a standard layout, whereas the image on the right is designed with a right-handed user's perspective more in mind. Instead of typing all over the phone to access a color, one can simply fan their thumb back and forth to choose between the options. As was mentioned, since most of the world is right-hand dominant, have a look at this heat map of where it is easy to press buttons and where it is difficult to press them. Most buttons that are progressive, which means continuing the process, going to the next step, it's more common for them to be located in the lower right-hand side of the screen, where it's very easy for a user to just continue to tap the button right there. However, the top left side of the screen is where you should put your regressive buttons. These are buttons that will go back or main menu. In fact, if you look at most iOS applications on an iPhone or iPad, this is exactly where you will find these buttons in the upper left corner. Because going back is a very disruptive process unless that is exactly what you intend to do. So if a user wants to go back, they will not mind that extra stretch of the thumb to touch that corner of the screen or even using a second hand to touch it. Also, through any processes, especially if you're purchasing anything or paying any fees or fines through your application, include a list of the different steps that are involved and where the user is in that process. I think we've all been through this when we are purchasing something online. It's nice to know what is the next step. If I click continue or next, does that actually commit me to the purchase yet or doesn't it? Keep in mind this steady progression through the services as you are developing your application. Also consider navigation best practices. There's something called the three click rule. And what this means is that just about any function within an application 
should be accessible to a user within three clicks. An easy way to do this is to make one click the main menu. Think of the home button on an iPhone. Press that single button and you're right back to the home screen. Now you have two clicks to get to any application you want. Think of that when you are designing your application. Also keep in mind that every single step in that flowchart we mentioned earlier, that could very well be considered one click. So as you are laying out the different steps and layers of that process, keep in mind every step is one click and keep that three click process in mind. Also remember when you're creating applications that navigation is different across devices. Android devices by default, either in the hardware or in the operating system, have a back button built into them. There's no need to include a back button in your application for Android. However, if you forget to include that button on an iOS application, that's going to be very disruptive. The only option the user will have if they want to go back is to leave the application entirely and start over. Do not forget that button for your iOS applications. Also consider security. Now, best security practice is to make it transparent to the user. It's there, it's protecting them, but it should never interfere with what they are doing. Still, if someone is going to type in a credit card number, they're a little hesitant about sending that information. They want some kind of reassurance that the information they are sending is actually going to be protected. Usually the best way to reassure a user with this is to provide some kind of statement or some kind of logo from a trusted security provider that your information is protected and maybe even a small statement of how we are protecting it using SSL, encryption. However you choose to provide it, do include some kind of picture or statement that reassures the users their sensitive data is going to be protected. Also, don't recreate services. I think we've all seen this at one point or another. You can create an account on a website or you can log in with Facebook or log in with Google. Why create an account on another website if I can just use my account from one of those two instead? Well, if you can find a way to integrate something like that into your service, you save the user from having to create a totally separate account for them to be able to use your mobile application. But is Facebook and Google really the best option to use for a government service? Now, the good news is here in the UAE, the Emirates ID Authority is working to provide this kind of single sign-on capability to all government entities and all of their mobile services. So keep an eye on them. Keep an eye on their progress for that service, and when it does become available, be sure you work to integrate it into your service. Also implement one-click calling. And to explain what this is, as a user, your mobile application is your organization interfacing with me. If I am having problems with your mobile application, I might get frustrated to the point where I just give up on it and I want to call your organization. How frustrating is it then to then close the application, open a web browser, search for your organization, search around your website, find a mobile number, and then type it in and call. Whereas, if you included a function in your mobile application that I press the button and suddenly it's dialing that number, right away, that does make me feel better. Because even though I did have some problems using your mobile application, it was just one click and I'm connecting with a human being who can help me work through my uh, process. Also, remember, GPS sensors exist in mobile devices. So if you're going to provide any kind of service that would in any way need or use a user's location, don't forget to integrate into that. If I'm going to call for a taxi, why should I have a mobile application that describes where to pick me up when instead it could just grab my GPS coordinates and a taxi can come to exactly where I am. If you're not providing taxi services, one other thing to keep in mind is if I do need to go visit your entity in person, what's the closest branch? Where is it? How do I get there? The easiest thing to do is grab the user's GPS coordinates, 
plug it into a map API and provide that information back to them. Finally, don't forget to account for screen size and resolution. Across many different devices, especially Android, where there are so many different types out there, but also within iPhone, you will find different screen sizes and resolutions. Consider how the iPhone screen size has changed from the pre-iPhone 5 line of devices to the iPhone 5, and now on into the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus. Also remember that with iPads, you can have the exact same screen size, but different resolutions, because one may be a retina display, one may not be. Keep these differences in mind when you are designing your application, because as you can see on this slide, what may look great on one device ends up looking completely different on another.